I bet if you consider yourself a gearhead that at some point you've daydreamed about owning a swapped vehicle. The styling functionality of your favorite ride coupled with the ideal powertrain. How can you go wrong, right? Whoa, I mean, it's not bad, but it's not good. Here at Fluid Modian, we deal with a lot of swap vehicles. From start to finish swaps, finishing well-intended builds, correcting other people's mistakes, and maintaining some of the finest resto mods ever conceived. We know a thing or two about engine swaps, but what differentiates a build from a novelty to something that you can drive every day if you wanted to? We love Toyota and Lexus products. Working on a wide variety of vehicles has given us firsthand experience on their illustrious reliability. It's real people. So of course, you can't go wrong with the classic facelift first gen Tacoma. However, this one has a sneaky secret. Hey, pop the hood. Pop the hood? Pop the hood. 2JZ engine? No shit. There's not much to say about a 2JZ that hasn't already been said. So we won't bore you with going over its reliability, its ability to handle mods and vast aftermarket support. Drop that in one of the toughest little work trucks to ever be made, and you can see why this swap is a dream build for a ton of enthusiasts. Our reputation for being able to handle anything that comes in means we get to see some pretty wild stuff on a daily basis. You might think that this build surprises us, but without sounding too supercilious, this is just another day at Fluid Motor Union. If you don't believe me, then take a second to subscribe and turn on the notifications. Then if you could, like and comment. The more reaction we get from our viewers, the more resources we can spend showing you the wild stuff that shows up on any given day. It's a tiny gesture, but it means a lot, and there's really so much more for you guys to see. One of our customers recently purchased this, a 2001 Toyota Tacoma double cab 4x4 with the legendary 2JZ made it to a five-speed manual with the four-wheel drive still intact. It's been brought in first and foremost for an inspection and to get any update maintenance that might be needed, as well as a few small issues they might have noticed. And if we don't find anything too crazy, potentially take care of some livability concerns such as the AC delete due to the swap. We're still determining exactly what the customer is going to end up wanting, but we figured this is a pretty neat build and you might enjoy checking it out. Now, as I had mentioned, before we make any recommendations or quote out any work, we need to perform a detailed inspection to know exactly what we're getting into. And in this case, a test drive will be first done to give us an idea of what we want to look for before we get this on the rack. Oh, I killed it already. We're off to a bad start. Man, you really need to let that clutch out. There's like no response to this clutch. It's all that noise. It's just because we're right over the engine. Let's see if I can get used to this clutch. Nope. Man, that feels terrible. You can't, like, let it out. Hold on. What do you see? Floor over here. Is the hood open? It didn't look open when I walked up to it. It just looks weird on this side. No, it does on this side as well. Maybe not. No? It's latched, but it's just, like, Should it's I try pulling? higher than the fender. He's got, um... Well, if it's latched, it's not going to come I just mean, like, I couldn't pull it up, you know? It's like... It's like a bad combination of, like, a weirdly high throttle and, uh, like, this much clutch. I didn't even touch a clutch there. Like, wants to stall out. I wonder if something's going on with the idle. There's so much movement for it to be like the last tiny bit of clutch you're using. All right, that's got to get fixed. This car smells weird. Drive straight, but the wheel's off. Uh, I can't wait to get into it. And it sounds like it's going to be so much fun. Like this feels like a DIY car. Like, yeah. Somebody made it themselves, which is fine, but oh, here we go. 
I'm not gonna drop it at 2,500 every time. This sucks. All right, let's see. <laughs> That's horrible. Yeah, it's too cold to do that. Where did that spool at? Four grand? <laughs> yeah, it took a while. Yeah, but like from four to seven? Like, what would this sound like if you really were trying to off-road it? Like, you're not like just letting the clutch out and rolling over stuff. You're gassing into it. There's a big delay there. Like, right when I hit it, it does something, but I don't know if like the tune's right. Like, I hit it, you hear it, and then it stalls. Yeah, that's terrible. I mean, it drives straight and it doesn't shake it all over the place in my hand. It feels like one of these trucks should, like a 4Runner, other than you get it over 4,000 and the whole thing is going to flip over. But it seems like it has little issues that's going to take a lot of work to fix. I don't know. I think I've seen enough. I'd rather check this thing out and see what's going on. Here's part of the leak. Looks like oil. But actually this isn't the worst swap I've seen, you know? It fits, it's neat, it's fairly clean. I just think it needs a little bit of work if it wants to be jump in and not worry about anything, which is what I think he's after with this thing. Let's put it up in the air and see uh, what's going on underneath. A big weak point for the Tacomas is the frame rotting out, which I don't know where this car was from. There was a recall where they replaced a lot of these frames. This one doesn't look too bad. We've got some Pretty good surface rust back here, but they tend to rot out in these areas. And a lot of these got replaced by Toyota under warranty. I think the warranty went for like 15 years. So it could have been recently done, but that being said, I think we can come up with a plan for him that will at least get this thing livable. So I know you said he wanted air conditioning as well. Location on the GS300 is directly below the power steering pump. So if we're gonna be removing that, it might be a good time to try to size that up. And instead of just replacing the lines, we might have to come up with new routing for the lines. Maybe he wasn't concerned with the AC at the time, but I'm gonna assume he wasn't concerned with the AC at the time because he doesn't have the condenser up front. The condenser, all the lines have been taken out. Whoa. I mean, it's not bad, but it's not good. So that timing belt looks a little old, a little suspect. I, I mean, I would say it's been in there for at least four to five years. I don't know. Usually you can't get that sort of dry aging and cracking on rubber unless it's been hot and cold cycled over a number of years. So my guess would be that that's been there for a while, but all in all, the swap isn't that bad. AC lines are just tricky to begin with to try to make yourself because of the pressures they have to hold. There's a few good kits out there, but it's always a trial and error of like, you get it clamped together and then see if it leaks because i guarantee you the stock stuff's not going to fit back up with this turbo being here that could be wrong it's probably a safe bet mounting the condenser mounting the compressor if we do the compressor we're going to have to redo the oil reservoir for the power steering the power steering pump lines all of that so that's just more on top of this thing again it's not like we can look at it and go oh the lines are just going to run this way and this way we kind of have to get in there and see what's going to work see what's going to make sense start the job but once you start the job you can't be like you kind of got to start the job and finish the job you can't get halfway and go oh you know it's this is going to take longer than I thought, oh well. So this is a hard one to Could give easily a- easily double your time. Yeah, give an accurate estimate until you get in there. So in these sort of situations, communication is the best option. Just sitting down, talking with the customer, making sure they understand what they're getting into, what the end result might be, and if it's worth it for them, if we find out it's more difficult than originally planned. Will he continue and would he be happy with that as long as he had running AC? Um, that's always a tough thing to say to people as well because you don't want them to think you're just opening up a running tally and adding whatever you want. They have to have some sort of trust with you. And at the same time, like in this case where you have a good customer, you can't betray that trust. So you they're relying on you to be the professional, to be the expert and I don't know, it doesn't feel very good when you just tell them, yeah, we'll see where it ends up, you know? You kind of want to give them a set answer and try to stick to that, but you don't want to sell yourself short and get stuck in a trap where you're doing hours and hours of labor unpaid because that ends up as a bad result for both parties, both the, the shop doing the work 
as well as the customer because if you're not getting paid and you're trying to figure something out and you're just trying to crank it out, the quality is going to suffer as well. So we need to make sure that the customer is really prepped for what this could entail. But at the same time, I think we can come up with a game plan and just kind of see if we can keep to that game plan. Um, but there's no finites. There's no sure things in this and getting this thing more livable, we'll say. All right, we've been fortunate enough to have met Jason here and he's an awesome customer. He's got a lot of really interesting cars. He's got some pretty good taste in cars as well. Uh, most of them fit right up my alley. This thing definitely is something that we love. It's a Toyota product. Who doesn't love a 2JZ? I don't know, why don't you tell us a little bit of why, why you liked, you know, what, what drew you to this car? Well, I've, ha I've owned a Super for 16 years. I've driven it in my, most of my 20s. We used to do a lot of racing back then in the actual Supra. So the 2JZ has always had my heart. Despite the fact that I've had, you know, I've got a lot of different cooler toys now, the 2JZ is always a platform that is, has a soft spot in my heart. And you put that into a Tacoma where you actually have some uh, functionality other than just, uh, I don't know, going fast. Um, I think that makes for a pretty interesting build. Taking this thing from something that is like a nice toy to drive around to something that you could be comfortable with every day is gonna take a little bit of work. I wanna go through that with you. Getting your vision with how you see using the car is gonna be pretty important for what we're going over, so. It's like what he's talking about with the condenser, which we'd wanna put it right in front of the radiator. And the first thing I noticed is it's got a big fan on this side and then two fans on this side. So I'm hoping that'll give us the room there, you know, cause it's gotta go between the intercooler and the radiator, but it's just kinda hard to, say, you know, until we get like the grill bumper, all that stuff off. I mean, ideally, Keller, you'd probably want to use OE stuff, like the stuff that came in the Tacoma, as much as we could where possible, right? Like, that'd be the idea. Yeah, that'll just save on like fabrication time, all that making new stuff, you know? Metal lines, all that stuff in the box, I don't think it's gonna work because it kind of runs along the fender here, like right where the turbo is, mm -hmm. which isn't a big deal, like we could, you know, make new air conditioning lines, but it's kind of just adapting it, you know, to the condenser. This is where the condenser inside the car would be. Then with the power steering, you know, redoing the power steering lines to make room for the for the air compressor, AC compressor. So yeah, um, it's just a matter of getting from the, the evaporator inside the car to the compressor and then back down. The brake issue, I feel like the rear brakes are pretty delayed when you hit up, when you get on them. You know, like you hit the brake and then it's kind of like, oh, it stops, you know? I want to look into that like wheel alignment, things that I feel like when you're driving it might annoy you, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, we can get AC in there and take care of other things and you're like, oh, this is still bugging me, you know, so we'll put all that together. There's some things sure. like reservoirs is kind of tight on there, you know, the crankcase ventilation is just dumping down there. <clears throat> I mean, it's just going to lead to it covering the engine in oil and then you probably smell it. Again, one of those things, like, it's not a big deal for like a, what OJ's saying, a toy kind of thing, but you know, if you drive it somewhere, I'm saying annoying, you know, like it would annoy me. Like if you smell oil, if it's the steering wheel's crooked or something, you know, the brakes aren't quite right. That's the kind of maintenance stuff that I'm talking about. Yeah, we can go up. Uh, I noticed that when you run this thing, it kind of makes a lot of noise. And I think that's mostly from the fact that that hard line and the fuel regulator are touching the firewall. I think if we make a bracket for that and move that off, you're not going to hear that noise. The ticking noise? It's like, it's like a ticking, whirring noise that like it's pretty pronounced. I heard it right away and I was like, the valve train really isn't this loud. Like I know everything's right. kind of back there, but it sounded different and sure, like it kind of sounded um, on RPM, but a higher pitch than what you'd hear with a camshaft or something that'd be controlled by that. And then sure enough, there's the, you know, the fuel regulator. So I think you're just hearing all those pulses oh. hitting the firewall. I did so, notice that, yeah. So just bringing it off, I think is gonna quiet that down a lot, you know? Mm. That's not good. You can kind of see how it's like rubbing through there. Oh, so well, we'd, yeah. we'd have to correct that regardless, but um, I think that's going to take care of that, like I said, buzzing, ticking buzzing noise. At, it's a kind of a high frequency. I did notice that, yeah, yeah. All right, now we You might still it. hear something just due to the nature of the injectors, you know, but... I always thought it was maybe just the definitely. injectors are just extremely loud. And then again, like long term, like this ignition coil is not bolted down because the heater hose runs right be behind oh. it. Again, like that's not a bad fix. We could just get a new hose, reroute the hose so that the hold down can actually be used. It's just like little stuff I'm seeing here and there that's just gonna add yeah. up to a bunch of stuff, you know? Like, except for this one point here, mm -hmm. it looks like that's why they added it. Like, they went far enough over that I'm not concerned with it. Oh, yeah. And like, this would just be a bump stop anyway. 
if you bottomed out the suspension or something. So like, I don't think that's gonna happen unless you're you know, flying over a bridge or something. But again, like it looks like it's been well done. So that's like a reinforced so, kind of. Uh, yeah, like this whole like cutout thing right here. Mm -hmm. It goes all the way around. Sometimes they'll use them to fix corroded areas, but I don't see on the opposite side evidence of that corrosion. So I think maybe this was just an enthusiast fi fixing it, hmm. you know, just preemptively getting something on there to make sure it doesn't happen. Mm. The frame is in such good condition. I'm also gonna like just recommend that we do, um, basically you run baking soda into a pressure washer and it can clean off some of that surface rust. We blast it all down and then treat it with like a, a wool wax or something because if you plan on driving this thing, keeping it long-term in the winter ever, like you would not believe how fast that frame will get affected. I would say two or three winters before you start seeing something start to eat at that like wow. if it is an original frame and wasn't ever redone by the dealership so wow. now would kind of be an opportune time to just clean it all off and get something on there to protect it from ever happening you know what i mean yeah this isn't a car that's going to be sitting for a long time and then i'll drive it like once a month and the issues are not going to affect me too much yeah so you know like you said there's little things here and there that could be fixed which would make my uh day a lot better noticing a couple Engine oil leaks too. I always thought the pan was leaking. It's actually leaking from this weld here. It looks like that was the original oh. spot for the drain plug, which would you know go right up against the frame, so they moved it. We'd have to take that off, you know, see if we could fix that or get a new pan for it, you know, something along those lines. Because every time you wipe it off, it starts right here uh, at this weld. So again, yeah. like it, the, the nothing main, we can't handle. You know, it's just kind of close. The main issue with that though is that we're not sure you can get the pan out without having to pull the motor. Pull the motor. Now, with that said, these are things we could do in the interim and then maybe take care of that when more service requires it, yes. But we want to make you aware of like what we think it might be to get that to stop. Because let's just say we fix oil leaks and then like um, two months later, you're like, it's still leaking oil. Well, we didn't address this issue. We got this issue taken care of, but not that. So we just want to, you know, make everything transparent so that way you know like... Mm -hmm okay well now the leak is much smaller so that leak's acceptable but you know what i mean like just so you can kind of plan stuff out but mm -hmm. we're not saying you got to do the pan it doesn't look that bad and we might be able to put some silicone over it or something but we can't guarantee that you're not going to still have an oil leak if we address the other areas leaking oil okay one is right here this is this fitting right here that's the turbo drain line for the oil and it kind of pulled back like this this is just like heat insulation like it runs all the way up the line, so I think that's gonna need a new hose. Uh, again, it's not as bad, like that's, the pan is the biggest leak. So we got a little bit but, of a leak for the turbo return? Yeah, okay. that, and if you see up here, kind of this purple piece right there. Uh -huh. That's an adapter that he used to get engine oil pressure over to the turbo. That kind of looks like it's got a small leak too. Mm. So again, like it's all these little things that like, that would be livable, that would be livable, but like all combined, you know, it's just gonna add up into mm -hmm. different stuff, which is why I'm asking, you know, like long-term, probably get it taken care of yeah yeah i definitely want to get any kind of leak like these taken care of yeah and then a couple of other things i noticed like this ball joint has a tiny bit of play you know again like it's not bad but again it's not a big repair either and then this shock is leaking oil out of the top hmm. like it drives okay you know right now like i don't feel any issues with it again like long term it's just going to keep leaking out and then eventually not be working right do you think we um we should replace the power steering pump too do you think it's leaking it does look like it's leaking out of the front seal there. Yeah, when I when I can look at it, it look does look like there's some kind of leak on the pump yeah. as well. So yeah, and okay. that's not a big deal either. Like we just include that with the new hoses and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely. And, and you can do the AC and stuff and all without having to pull the motor. You think? And all the right uh, now, yeah, because like, there's not any... a whole lot of room back there. Right. You know, no, I don't see any reason for the AC part to have to. Like if you look at it, out. most of the things that are in the way are the actual power steering lines, right? Yeah. So that's kind of why I was saying, like, if we redo all those power steering, or let's just say we fix it the way it is. Well, then if you're like, well, in the summer, you're like, I can't do this. This is way too, you know, I, I want AC. But we already redid the lines. We spent money. Part of that was getting the AC pump off there. And now we basically have to do all that over again. So that's wasted money, you know what I yeah. mean? Where if we do it all now, it might be obviously more, but at least we're not going backwards at any point, you know? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Did so, you know anything about, like, what clutch is in there? Or? No idea. All right, because it's like it's really grabby. Like there's nothing, you know, and then it kind of just like is all on at once. I, I'm yes. almost like wondering if it's um, if it's just the the linkage and how they got, you know, because it it should be the stock transmission coupled with the stock linkage, stock 
to whatever it would need to run this engine. So it almost feels like while the clutch is good, the play in the, sh the clutch lever or whether it be the um, the actual like slave cylinder itself, there's so much play in it and you only have like this much that's actually engaging, right? So it's like, is there a way for us to mess with that clutch lever where we take that small amount of, you know, actuation and spread it out to the rest of the clutch travel or is that something that you know like we, we're just we're going to take a look into that to see if it's a relatively i don't want to say easy but relatively straightforward yeah uh, you know because obviously i don't want to get into pulling it down coming up with a new clutch and everything else if it's working it's working but we can make that better because it was annoying me just like <laughs> like i don't stall cars out i drive a lot of stuff and i stalled this thing out like three times like i did notice it was a lot harder to drive than normal cars but I just put it up to uh, not driving a manual car no, for a I'll, long time. I'll let time. you off on that because I, uh, <laughs> I also got bit by that a few times. But I think we might be able to make that better. But I also think that there's something else going on, whether it be with the ECU tune, like in that transition area, or something he came across, which was a spark plug that had a crack in cylinder one. Sometimes you could have a weird misfire at certain load ranges oh. that might be... Because like, when you let that clutch out, it almost like like hesitates and then goes, you know what I mean? So I'm almost wondering if that's more engine mechanical or engine, um, you know, calibration than it actually is something going on with the clutch or something else. So I'm gonna look into that too. I'd probably just start with him doing the plugs and then see if that clears it up because that might be all in it. At the same time, do we get that set? Do we get the clutch figured out and then find out it's still got a hesitation, which is annoying to, See, it's almost like you got to drop it above two grand to like to let it out. That'll get old quick in traffic, you know? So. Yeah, yeah. Notice a small leak starting at this axle boot. It's barely even coming out of there yet. Again, like long term, eventually it's going to leak Over all the time, grease out. Over time, probably have yeah. to address that issue. That, yeah. I'd want to redo these hoses too. For the This is for a radiator hose. Mm -hmm. Just because what I'm feeling in the one up, front, up top, like there's no like flare on the On the fitting. inside here? Yeah. Oh, it's, it's just like a like, pipe? Yeah. So like, it's holding, you know, like it works. If it was my car, you know, I'd probably just swap these out for a different style. Yeah, it's probably prudent just, to do that. Yeah, it would be so simple. It wouldn't be worth risking, you know, losing a radiator hose or something. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah I think that about covers it. I mean, all the brakes are good. You know, like the rear brakes look new. Oh, I changed all the brakes out when I got it. That was okay. the first thing I do to a lot of the cars that I do. Yeah. I just change out the brakes. I don't trust it. <laughs> So I swapped out all the brakes yeah. and uh, the e-brake wasn't working either because mm -hmm. it was all just rusted and stuck. Yeah, I saw there's like new levers and everything yeah, back yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, I installed that, so. Cool. Yeah, that's about it. Did you have any questions? Anything? Uh, no, I mean, uh, it was good to know like all the stuff, the comprehensive stuff that you guys uh, found out about the car and um, what the important issues are, the stuff that should get addressed and what to address at the same time. And we'll and, try to prioritize it for you so that we works out in a way that like you don't have to do everything at once and it'll kind of be this makes sense to do now this makes sense to wait on yeah that about sums it up think you can get it done before uh summertime oh yeah yeah <laughs> nothing here is too crazy it's all straightforward the biggest thing is just going to be any of the lines for the ac i think that's the biggest challenge yeah um we do plenty of intercooler mounting and reworking so if we've got to move that back a little bit uh, okay. plenty of mounting of fans um there's not know. a whole lot of tacomas with two jay-z but the ones that i saw that have ac they did somehow squish the condenser in I, between here I, I think it's going to fit factory it's just what do we do with those fans maybe that means going to a bigger slim fan instead of three different fans you mm -hmm. know what i mean and like working it somewhere in there so we have the room um that's, that's kind of what I mean, like I don't know where it's gonna end up because we can have a plan, but then when we actually see the room or get the pieces in there that we need, it's kind of like, well, what do we do now? And that's that's kind of where we gotta kind of trust each other. You know, like I, said, I know you don't want a big bill and I'm not here to run up your bill, but I can't promise like if we say this, that there's not gonna be changes along the way. Yeah, you know? yeah, so. absolutely. Our inspection revealed a Garrett GT3582 turbocharger boosting to a hair over 12 PSI. And while that might not sound like a ton of boost, when coupled with this massive intake manifold, tubular exhaust manifold, and a front mount air-to-air -air intercooler, a little goes a long way. The owner provided some documentation of a light engine build with Eagle connecting rods, balanced crankshaft, CP pistons, APR main and head studs, and a ported oil pump. Other than a heavy coating of oil on the outside, this engine looks pretty fresh. 
a Haltech engine management computer and digital dash control along with GTR style coil packs fed by a high capacity fuel system featuring a radium fuel rail and regulator with injector dynamics 1050cc injectors and what we believe to be a high flow fuel pump. The way it currently sits should put this thing a good bit over 400 horsepower. Now a big key to getting this whole swap to work was the Akina Motorsports bell housing for the transmission. Sure, you can drop a 2JZ into a real wheel drive car, but without the 4x4, you might as well have bought a GS300. Having the 5 speed manual and the dual range transfer case mated to the Turbo 2J are what get the Taco and Toyota fans drooling. The truck is also styled with 15 inch alloy wheels with a modest size 32 inch tire, Bilstein shocks all around, and aftermarket taillights. A while back, we did a video where we went over five things to know before you buy a resto mod. Now, while all those points are applicable, expectations are a bit different the closer you get to the current model year. And when I was much younger and more adaptable, I didn't really need creature comforts in my vehicle. It was all about enjoying the drive first and foremost. So I drove some pretty sketchy cars long distances over many years, and that experience taught me the difference between owning a toy and having something that really drives nice in a wide range of scenarios. As you can guess, owning my own shop and having to drive a wide range of vehicles for diagnostic reasons has also affected my perspective on what makes a car something you can live with and something you could just tolerate. I always like to leave you guys with something to take away after watching our videos. Let's talk about expectations when it comes to doing a swap like this. The Toyota Tacoma market has gotten a little pricey over the last few years as their reputation for toughness and off-road ability has propagated even with the known frame issues. Right now, an okay conditioned truck, something you'd feel good, maybe for a candidate for a swap, can be found around $8,000 with better condition models fetching much higher prices. So let's just say maybe you could find something that needs major engine work for 5,000 with an okay frame. Two JZs have gotten also a lot more pricey, even when we're talking about the GEs, and they're pretty much going for 2,500. All right, so the bell housing, $350. Let's say the clutch is $375, the Garrett Turbo, $1,800, a tubular manifold, $600, an intake manifold to clear the brake booster, $800. Injectors, at least $800. Fuel system, $1,100. Haltech engine management and the cluster with the wiring harness, north of $3,000. A custom exhaust with cutout, $1,500. Intercooler, $300. We're looking at $18,000 in just parts. I looked at the lowest prices too without shipping. This is just to illustrate a point. Before we even got to the estimates of the labor or things we'd find along the way that a cheap truck might need, I think it's safe to say being conservative on running wires, making fittings, fitting the engine and trans mounts, fitting the drivetrain, hooking up linkages, piping hoses, etc., etc., yada, yada, yada. Even if you had a buddy that can put in the labor with you and you did a lot of a DIY, you're not even gonna get a competent shop to blink at this for less than the price that I went over, $18,000. $32,000 is a modest price, but what do we get for that? This is still a toy. It's not something you could comfortably daily, no AC, and still lots of little issues it needs to make it worry-free. That's a big chunk of change, even conservatively at the low end. Maybe you see this and wonder why someone would want to spend this money. For car enthusiasts, vehicles are an expression of themselves. It's how you choose for the automotive world to view your tastes and preferences. What you drive signals to other enthusiasts what you're into. People spend a lot of money on their image in all sorts of manners. Designer, fashion, jewelries, expensive hobbies, fitness, on and on and on. At the end of the day, it's just a car, but it matters to us. I get a little irked when people start spouting off on the necessity of performance on or off road. Unless you're in a regulated competition, you don't actually care about performance. Rather, you want other people to view you as someone who prioritizes performance on their vehicles. If you get down to it, it just isn't any different than wanting 24s on your ride or finishing your car in an orange Raptor bedliner. These builds matter to who we feel we are. And when you come at it from that angle, you realize that it's okay to be a little frivolous with your funds. Do what you like, but don't waste your money. 
Customers cheaping out on items is the biggest regret we deal with at FMU. Taking a chance on someone who gave you a too good to be true price can double your cost easily. So take your time and do your research. It's also okay if your car doesn't have every feature. Some of the most fun I've had driving in cars, I wouldn't trust to drive on the highway, and that's okay. Just understand that you're not an automotive manufacturer and neither is your shop. Any build is gonna have a compromise. And if you can live with it, then that's all we really can expect. Our goal with our videos is to showcase the interesting vehicles that our shop is uniquely privy to. But I wanna do more than just that. I love builds from going fast, off-roading, concourse restorations, show cars, and even just making your daily a little bit more enjoyable. But this is an expensive hobby, even if you're a DIYer. I think a big problem that's perpetuated in the age of social media is that builds are perfect. And I can confidently say that no matter what you might seen out there, it's seldom the case. You need to be comfortable with the time, energy, and money that goes into these processes. And the only way you can do that is to really think deep and long before you start. And doing your research to make sure you're making decisions that will need to not have to be redone in the future is critical. Lots of enthusiasts would kill for a build like this Tacoma, but as it sits, it's a long way from perfect and more of a novelty. Not something you could just jump in and drive carefree. We've got this thing on track to be something the customer can truly hop in and enjoy under any circumstance. And we know it'll be worth it for them in the end. There'll be more on this taco coming and you can expect to see this on the dyno coming up here in future videos. So stay patient, stay tuned, and We'll see you next time.